Good morning, Antonio, dear guests, friends and colleagues. It is my great honour to welcome you all in person and virtually to Dublin Castle to begin our high-level engagement on global diaspora and to prepare our contribution to the UN International Migration Review Forum in a few weeks from now. I'm especially grateful to those of you who have travelled great distances to be with us here today. I also want to acknowledge those of you who have begun observing Ramadan and to wish you all the blessings of the holy month. Dublin Castle was the administrative centre of British rule here in Ireland. The handover of this castle, which was exactly 100 years ago, marked the birth of our modern, independent Irish state. It is fitting to commemorate that occasion by hosting the Global Diaspora Summit of the Member States of the International Organisation for Migration. For our state, might not have come into being, or thrived, without the contribution of our emigrants and the continued support of the global diaspora formed by generations of our people who have migrated right across the world. So I would like to dedicate this meeting to all of our collective diasporas. Forged by hardship at home and abroad, they are strong and they are resilient. They are communities that want to give back to contribute to the places that they or their families left behind, as well as to the places where they made their new homes. Ireland has the privilege to be both a mother country and, more recently, an adopted country. Our diaspora engagement recognises the migrants who left our shores, but also recognises those who have arrived. We treasure those ties from our relationship with these communities also ties us to all of you. That is why diaspora policy is a key element of our work to foster international development and cooperation. Ireland is heartened to see the growing number of countries who recognise, as we do, the value of that engagement, as well as the benefit that diaspora-focused approach can bring to complicated issues around international migration policy. So I'm looking forward to exchanging ideas and experiences with you in the course of the next two days. And I would now like to invite Antonio Vitorino, the Director General of IOM, to formally begin our proceedings. Thank you so much, Colm. Uh, excellencies, honorable ministers, distinguished guests, good morning to all of you. For me, it is a pleasure to welcome you all to the Global Diaspora Summit here in the very art of Dublin. Please allow me to start by extending my sincere gratitude to the government of Ireland and particularly to uh, Minister Brophy for their leadership and I must say, and I think I speak on behalf of all of us, your very warm hospitality. In 2013, as it has already been recalled, IOM organized the first International Diaspora Ministerial Conference in Geneva to recognize the role of uh, diasporas and transnational communities as development actors. Since then, yes, since then, there have been developments, quite a lot of developments in the field of multilateral migration governance, such as the adoption of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in 2015, the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration in 2018, and very soon, as the Minister has just mentioned, we will meet together at the International Migration Review Forum. The GCM sets out a 360 degree vision of international migration and a holistic approach to migration governance. We have developed together a set of clear commitments based on key principles such as international cooperation, sustainable development, and the all of society approach. Most importantly, the GCM calls for a people-centered approach to migration which highlights the agency and the impact of individuals, of concrete individuals. Transnational migrants are actors that, empowered through their networks, 
and with the skills that they bring, can make major contributions to society. Diasporas have repeatedly demonstrated that their resilience and will to support their communities can move mountains. No matter the distance or adversities, diasporas have a unique drive to create innovative initiatives, deploy humanitarian responses, and react efficiently to any, any crisis. There are so many examples where diasporas have shown their solidarity and commitment to protect and support their communities, both in the short and the long term, be it uh, at times of stability or during crisis. Over the last several years, we have seen how COVID-19 has deeply impacted households all around the world, including, of course, migrants. Despite this, mobilized diaspora communities continued not only to send remittances and other financial aid back home, but also share medical knowledge and key information on how to best respond to the pandemic. And as people have fled conflict recently in Ukraine, their fellow nationals across the world have responded, whether providing financial, psychological, and social support to those in need, or providing shelter and a place to rest. Diaspora groups, time and again, have proved to be critical partners. And we, at IOM, we continue to work together with them across the world to create support and development programs for home communities. Our work includes not only first-generation migrants, but we take an inclusive approach to diaspora engagement, working to empower second and third generation community members, who often have great interest to reaffirm their identities and greater access to capital to engage with their own and also the host societies in very creative ways. The future of diaspora engagement will be certainly driven by more digital connections and multicultural exchanges. Our discussions, I believe to, that led us here, have already been rich. And we hope that as an outcome of this summit, we can identify and agree a future agenda of diaspora engagement, aligned with Objective 19 of the Global Compact for Migration. Over the past month, regional consultations and multiple preparatory meetings have taken place to capture the specific needs and commitments of governments and diasporas. Through this, policymakers and practitioners have jointly determined a concise, yet I believe visionary plan of action to support further strategic engagement of diaspora organizations. We live, Excellencies, in unprecedented and turbulent times. There are multiple conflicts, many of them protracted, around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to impact many countries, including the least developed. And the need to respond to the increasing relevance of the impacts of climate change and environmental degradation in displacement of people becomes ever more urgent. There will no doubt be future challenges ahead of us. However, I am certain that the diasporas will remain a constant, standing ready to engage and meet the needs of their communities. I wish you, all of us, I wish you, I wish us a successful meeting. Thank you. And as DG Vitorino said, uh, diasporas can indeed move mountains. Well, now let's welcome back for his opening keynote, Minister Brophy. 
Thank you very much um, for those remarks. Um, last night was the census night in Ireland. So in about 100 years from now, when the census forms are made public, genealogists may be surprised to find a record of a small but important group of international dignitaries who traveled to Dublin Castle from across the globe to share the experience and connections of migration and the diaspora. Orders for the very first census in Ireland were given from this building we're in today, just over 200 years ago. Ever since then, they have recorded the great migration of people to and from our island. The ancestors of our great global diaspora, which is now over 70 million people strong, and the founders of other diaspora who've chosen to settle here in Ireland. The census is a record of tragedy and loss. Also, it's a record of success and return. In the 19th century, they count the millions forced to leave our Ireland due to famine and political oppression. In the 20th century, they count Ireland's transition from an underdeveloped country to a thriving independent state. In the 21st century, they will count not only our guests here in Dublin Castle this morning, but also the thousands of recently arrived Ukrainians forced to flee their homes for our shores. These, our most recent migrants, are like many before them, the victims of an unjustifiable conflict and of immoral, immoral political choices made elsewhere. I want to commend the Ukrainian diaspora who have reached out to provide humanitarian assistance and shelter to their fellow countrymen and women, and to reiterate the full support of the Irish people at home and abroad for their efforts. This census will show that we stand where we have always stood, between the future and the past. And while we cannot change what has been, we can learn to change what will be. It is the principal reason why we've come together today, to share the experience of our diaspora and to strengthen the engagement with them. It is, I believe, a vital task if we are to meet the global challenges and opportunities of migration. They invest in businesses, in infrastructure, in their countries of origin. They engage actively in the transfers of skills and knowledge and they make connections, they open doors. They do so much, and they have the potential to do so much more if the right conditions are put in place to make that possible. The international community increasingly recognizes how much migrants and their diasporas matter. 2006 actually saw the appointment by the UN Secretary General for the first special representative for international migration, an Irishman, Peter Sutherland. It also saw the first UN high-level dialogue on international migration and development. And there have been a number of milestones since then, including the first diaspora ministerial conference in 2013, and of course the adoption of the Global Compact for Migration in 2018. We also recognize that human mobility is not a phenomenon that can be looked at in isolation. In the unanimously agreed UN declaration, which accompanied the Sustainable Development Goals adopted in 2015, we stated clearly and explicitly that we recognize the positive contribution of migrants for inclusive growth and sustainable development. In the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants of 2016, we reaffirmed the positive contribution of migrants to economic and social development in their countries of origin and in their countries of destination. We also explicitly referenced the involvement of diasporas in economic development and reconstruction. But in Objective 19 of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, we agreed to create the conditions for migrants and diasporas to fully contribute to sustainable development in all countries. Now what this summit sets out to do, therefore, is to focus on how concretely we can work together to ensure that the contribution of migrants and diasporas to development can be further enhanced. This summit builds on the important progress that's already been made so far. Most immediately, it'll feed into the International Migration Review Forum in May of this year. So once again, can I take the opportunity to welcome you to Dublin 
I'm very much looking forward to what we will achieve over the coming two days. So thank you very much. And thank you, Minister Brophy. Well, each of our lead participating states will now share their thoughts ahead of today's conversations. And we are very honoured that our first contribution comes from the Prime Minister of the Republic of Fiji, the Honourable Varenke Baini Muramama, who joins us virtually. You are very, very welcome, Prime Minister. Bulawanaka and warm greetings from Fiji. Strengthening uh, engagement with the diaspora communities is a priority for Fiji. Our communities abroad make a huge contribution to Fiji, particularly through remittances and investment. Remittances are now Fiji's second largest source of foreign exchange. In fact, over the last 10 years, remittances averaged the equivalent of 4.7% of our GDP. When our tourism industry came to a standstill during the COVID-19 pandemic, Remittances increased by more than 16% over the previous year. Diaspora communities are particularly important in traditional societies like ours, where family ties are strong. Remittances supplement the incomes of family members in normal times, but they increase during emergencies such as pandemics, natural disasters and conflicts. In 2016, when Fiji was ravaged by tropical cyclone Winston, contributions poured in from our diaspora communities all over the world to both families and official relief funds. Fiji fully supports the vision of this summit to promote a whole of government and whole of society approach to diaspora engagement. We engage actively with Fijians abroad through our diplomatic missions. This includes creating opportunities for our diaspora to participate in socio-economic development back home. And our recent launch of our National Digital Transformation Program has made it easier for diaspora communities to invest in Fiji. Fijians living abroad bring experiences, new perspectives, and even skill sets that we need as Fiji grows and modernizes. We want to capture all that experience and the goodwill that comes with it. My ministers and I make it a point to meet with Fijians living abroad whenever we travel. We normally have a dialogue session because they often have questions to ask and concerns to share, and we want to hear their perspective. They have left Fiji physically, some temporarily and others for the long term, but they carry Fiji within them. We welcome any citizen who wants to stay fully engaged with Fiji. No Fijians who become citizens of another country need give up their Fijian citizenship. And we encourage Fijians living abroad to vote in national elections. This journey is not complete and Fiji will continue to pursue additional opportunities to build our engagement with our diaspora communities. With those few words, I wish you a successful and productive global diaspora summit. And thank you. Prime Minister Bani Ramama, thank you so, so much. Next we go to Colombia and to Her Excellency Martu Lucia Ramirez, Vice President and Minister of Foreign Affairs. You're very, very welcome. Su Excelencia Con Brofi, Honorable Antonio Vitorino, Distinguidos Ministros, Embajadores, a todas las personas que están aquí presentes físicamente y digitalmente, en nombre del presidente de Colombia, Iván Duque, y de todo el pueblo de Colombia, es un honor para mí participar en esta Cumbre Mundial de la Diáspora organizada por el gobierno de Irlanda y por la Organización Internacional para las Migraciones, que tiene como propósito hacer un balance de los logros frente al cumplimiento del Objetivo 19, crear condiciones para que los migrantes y las diásporas contribuyan plenamente al desarrollo sostenible de todos los países. Nuestra reunión ocurre en un contexto crítico de incremento de los flujos migratorios a nivel mundial y nos obliga a evaluar la eficiencia del sistema multilateral y de las capacidades regionales frente a los flujos migratorios como un paso fundamental 
para abordar un fenómeno que seguramente seguirá creciendo. En América Latina, el pueblo venezolano vive una tragedia humanitaria por cuenta de la violación de los derechos humanos, la ausencia de ingresos y una dictadura que marchitó la democracia. Estas son las principales fuentes de la diáspora y la inmigración en nuestra región y ahora se agravan, obviamente, a nivel mundial con la invasión de Rusia a Ucrania. La situación de Venezuela nos demuestra que ha habido una gran incapacidad colectiva para prever situaciones tan críticas como la ruptura de la democracia, sumado a la terrible crisis de Siria y Ucrania, que sumadas las tres, muy posiblemente antes de finalizar este verano, afectarán a más de 15 millones de seres humanos que necesitan respuestas mucho más efectivas. A esto se suma el caso de Nicaragua, donde es previsible que pueda haber un aumento en el flujo migratorio debido al afianzamiento reciente de la dictadura en ese país. Para crear condiciones para que los migrantes contribuyan plenamente al desarrollo sostenible en todos los países, debemos ser novedosos y ambiciosos en la forma en que abordamos la migración. La respuesta humanitaria debe limitarse a un corto plazo y reemplazarse rápidamente por esquemas reales de incorporación a través de oportunidades de trabajo, educación, emprendimiento para los migrantes que les permitan tener condiciones adecuadas de vida para ellos y sus hijos y de esta manera aportar al desarrollo económico de los países que los han acogido. Para nosotros ha sido fundamental trabajar en esta incorporación, especialmente para los menores de edad, que constituyen el 42% de los migrantes venezolanos que hay en Colombia, a quienes debemos oportunidades ciertas que vayan más allá de lo puramente asistencial a sus padres. Debe haber mayor capacidad de incorporarlos a la educación técnica, vocacional y universitaria. De este modo, se logrará una condición doble de empoderar económicamente a los migrantes y convertir a la diáspora en un activo valioso para el desarrollo de los países, generando inversión extranjera, redes transnacionales de conocimiento y catalizadores del desarrollo global. Para llegar a este punto no podemos normalizar el fenómeno de la migración con la escala y por las causas que la estamos viendo actualmente. Ya lo dijo el ministro, podría ser el cuarto país del mundo si se sumara toda esta migración que se encuentra repartida en distintas naciones. Debemos adoptar un marco común de mínimos de atención e integración a los migrantes que parta de dos principios complementarios y ambos indispensables, como hemos insistido en Colombia. Por una parte, el principio de corresponsabilidad, según el cual ningún país debería excusarse de ofrecer alternativas de democracia, protección y oportunidades a un determinado número de migrantes. Por la otra parte, obrando en aplicación del principio de humanidad, entendiendo que se trata de seres humanos despojados de la estabilidad de su hogar, con familias divididas, en condiciones precarias y muchos de ellos sin ninguna esperanza hacia el futuro. Aquí no podemos estar hablando simplemente de remesas. Esto no es un asunto eh, de, de recursos, se trata de un asunto de humanidad. Por ello, Colombia aspira a que la discusión incluya la determinación de cuál es el costo de la atención adecuada por migrantes. Se trata de un asunto crítico si tenemos en cuenta que, según ACNUR, el 85% de los refugiados del mundo se encuentran hoy en países en desarrollo. Debemos aspirar a que cada migrante cuente con un recurso per cápita de cooperación que sea suficiente y que realmente sea equivalente para todos los países receptores, permitiéndoles brindar condiciones equivalentes a los migrantes. Me acompaña en esta delegación el doctor Juan Francisco Espinosa, director de Migración Colombia, quien tiene a su cargo esa incorporación de dos millones de venezolanos que el gobierno colombiano ha decidido adoptar con las plenas condiciones y garantías que tiene cualquier otro colombiano. Y él podrá compartir con ustedes nuestra experiencia sobre el costo de cada migrante. Dado que todos los seres del mundo tienen necesidad de alimentación, educación, salud y un, salud y un techo, no existe motivo que justifique que los recursos destinados actualmente 
para los migrantes de Venezuela sean menores a un tercio de los recursos que se han destinado a los migrantes de Siria. Adicionalmente, requerimos que este foro compare las distintas experiencias y marcos jurídicos que se han expedido por distintos estados, tomando los mejores elementos de cada uno y de esta manera procurar estandarizar un modelo de estatuto de protección temporal que pueda ser aplicado en distintos países y regiones del mundo para lograr una respuesta mucho más solidaria, que tenga el impacto necesario para que estas personas puedan estabilizarse y normalizar sus condiciones de vida. Colombia pone a disposición su conocimiento y su experiencia. Al igual que Turquía, nuestros dos países se han convertido en muy poco tiempo en los principales receptores de migrantes de dos países fronterizos, Venezuela y Siria. La combinación de estas experiencias, así como la de los países aquí presentes, puede servir para formular un modelo de aplicación mundial. Colombia, a modo de ejemplo, puede compartir su experiencia en el diseño de un modelo pensado en el largo plazo que sustituya la ayuda humanitaria por la integración y como característica única en el mundo, nuestro gobierno ha ofrecido un permiso de residencia permanente, de acceso al trabajo y también de ciudadanía después de 10 años. En el mismo sentido, estamos interesados en aprender de Turquía, de Irlanda, de muchos de los países aquí presentes, los esquemas que un estudiante de maestría que se encuentra trabajando una comparación internacional, el doctor Kevin Augusto Ramírez, ha analizado con conclusiones muy interesantes. Por ejemplo, él señala cómo en Turquía el Kisilay Card permite esquemas de financiación al emprendimiento que además aseguran que los recursos de la cooperación lleguen directamente a los migrantes para impulsar su capacidad de generar ingresos estables, escalables y sostenibles en el tiempo. Casos como este resultan claves hoy cuando el mundo se encuentra en un momento donde todos los países estamos afectados por la pandemia que todavía no se ha concluido y por esa razón no hay recursos sobrantes en ningún lugar del mundo para ayudar a los migrantes. Ello implica entonces que debemos generar oportunidades para que ellos conviertan sus iniciativas en desarrollos empresariales y en generación de empleos en el país que los adopta. Por esa razón tenemos que reducir al mínimo los distintos eslabones, agencias, ONGs y tantos intermediarios en el manejo de los recursos destinados a atender a la población migrante. Esos recursos deberían ir efectivamente a quienes más lo necesitan. Señoras y señores, sabemos que nuestro encuentro en mayo en Naciones Unidas traerá grandes retos y oportunidades. Esperamos que esta sesión sea de utilidad para acercar posiciones, compartir preocupaciones y sobre todo encontrar soluciones creativas y modelos de atención comunes por el bien de nuestro mundo. Debemos continuar trabajando para que todos los actores del sistema internacional se comprometan a desplegar sus más grandes acciones a favor de las personas más vulnerables basados en estos principios de corresponsabilidad y, por supuesto, de humanidad para que nadie se cree atrás. Colombia, as a mother country, but also as an adopted country, we would like to uh, share with the Ireland experiences and also we would like to congratulate you, uh, dear minister, for the efforts, the leadership and the solidarity that you have shown not only with the Ukrainian, but also with some other migrants from the entire world. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very, very much, Minister. We are going to Mauritius next to His Excellency, Mr. Alan Gnu, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Regional Integration and International Trade. Thank you, uh, Chair. Your Excellency, Minister Brophy. Your Excellency, Director General of the International Organization for Migration. Your Excellencies, Honorable Ministers present today and colleagues participating virtually. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. Allow me at the very outset to express my deep appreciation to the Government of the Republic of Ireland and to the International Organization for Migration for the invitation extended to me to attend 
the, Glo the Global Diaspora Summit in Dublin. I wish to thank the organizers for all the facilities and courtesies extended to me and my delegation to enable our participation in this summit and for the warm welcome and hospitality extended to us since our arrival in Dublin. I feel honored and privileged to be here today and it is with an intense pleasure that I'm addressing this August assembly at the Dublin Castle. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, migration has been identified as a major driver of growth and development. This has led to its recognition as a cross-cutting issue relevant to target 10.7 of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. I quote, facilitate orderly, safe, regular, and responsible migration and mobility of people through the implementation of planned and well-managed migration policies, end of quote. Excellencies, Mauritius is a land of migrants. With no indigenous population, it has been peopled by migrants from all continents. In line with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the government of the Republic of Mauritius adopted a national migration and development policy and related action plan in June 2018 to harness the synergy between migration and development. The migration and development policy involves all relevant stakeholders with the objective to harness the nexus between migration and development, including the migration management desirable for Mauritius and identification of solutions and innovable approaches. The government of the Republic of Mauritius recognizes and acknowledges that our dispersed Mauritian diaspora community is a valuable asset to our economy. The Mauritius, the Mauritian diaspora is dispersed across several continents and should be encouraged to contribute to and participate in the sustainable socio-economic development of the country. Like many other countries, we are of the view that our diaspora are no longer, quote, lost actors, but are non-resident overseas national assets for the country. Our diaspora can be important contributors to skills, transfer, trade, investment, tourism, education, culture, and sport. Over the few years, we have implemented a number of measures and have been enhancing the existing mechanism to facilitate the involvement and contribution of our diaspora in the socioeconomic development of the country. Our efforts are geared towards identifying and connecting with these highly skilled individuals in order to link them to national economic development projects and priorities. Due to time constraint, I will briefly comment on a few of them. In November 2018, in line with the action plan, our government, in conjunction with the Office of International Organization for Migration in, uh, in Mauritius, embarked on the project, building the capacity of the Mauritian government to strengthen linkages with the Mauritian diaspora. The project was completed in 2020 and a report on the study produced in 2021. The survey revealed that there is a deep commitment by the diaspora towards Mauritius and there is a wish to contribute positively to the development of our country. Secondly, the government of the Republic of Mauritius and the IOM have embarked in 2021 on another laudable project entitled Mauritius Pilot Youth Diaspora Volunteering Project. This initiative complements the first joint engagement of the government and the IOM Mauritius on the challenging pro project building the capacity of Mauritian government to streng strengthen linkages with the Mauritian diaspora. The objective of this new project is to contribute to strengthening government capacity toward, uh, towards engaging the youth Mauritian diaspora in our national development and their cultural ties with their country of origin. This pilot Volunteering project will be a good way to combine professional rewards and personal gains, and the program will specifically allow young members of the diaspora to come and work for a limited period of time in Mauritius in their specific field of expertise. The pilot youth diaspora volunteering project would be a tangible engagement opportunity expected to contribute mutual trust and dialogue between the government of Mauritius and the youth of our diaspora uh, communities. The government welcomes IOM support and expertise to devise and successfully implement this pilot youth diaspora volunteering project, which will contribute to confidence and trust building 
as the project will be participatory and beneficial to the di diaspora uh, directly. The volunteering activities are expected to start in August 2022 and finish in March 2023. The government has also pres presently, is also presently in the process of setting up a diaspora cell under the aegis of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to coordinate and facilitate, facilitate diaspora initiatives and programs in order to outreach with, engage, and mobilize the diaspora. This cell is expected to further strengthen the ties and build mutual trust between the diaspora and the government in the long run. L last but not least, I will just come to a, another initiative that we have taken in view to encourage members of the Mauritian diaspora to return to the country. Our government established the Mauritian diaspora scheme in 2015. Accordingly, any member who before 24th of March 2015 has been living and working outside Mauritius and has the necessary skills, talent and experience and who is willing to return and serve Mauritius is eligible for registration. Registered members of the Mauritian diaspora scheme are eligible to the following. Exemption from payment of income tax for a period of 10 income years. Exemption from payment of excise duty to a maximum of 2 million rupees on a motor car. Exemption from payment of customs duty and value-added tax on household and personal effects. Exemption from registration duty for purchase of a res residential property under our smart city or property uh, development uh, schemes. Uh, a member of the Mauritian diaspora who is even not a citizen of Mauritius is also eligible for a permanent residence permit in Mauritius as well as his spouse and dependent. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, diaspora communities represent not only significant wealth in terms of knowledge, expertise, skills, experience and capital to invest in Mauritius, but are also a valuable source of ideas and, and proposals to tackle new challenges that are emerging in a post-COVID-19 world. In this intensely globalized, interconnected and interdependent world in which we are living presently, we have to harvest the best ideas and innovations and apply them in order to be successful. Our diaspora, our national assets constitute one of the major networks to achieve these objectives. What is ensuring, ladies and gentlemen, is that engagement with the diaspora is a non-competitive industry so that we should and need to share best practices among ourselves. To conclude, I am convinced that following our exchange of views, we will return to our countries with, with a clearer vision of the importance of our diaspora and effective ways for engagement so that all parties are winners. I have done. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Minister Gnu. We go next to Germany, and joining us online is Her Excellency Mrs. Reem Alabali Radovan, Minister for State, Migration, Refugees and Integration. You're very welcome, Minister. Honourable Minister Brophy, Honourable Director General Vittorino, dear colleagues, it's an honour to have the opportunity to speak at this outstanding conference. The Global Diaspora Summit presents an excellent opportunity to foster international cooperation and in exchange regarding the implementation of Goal 19 of the Global Compact for Migration. My gratitude goes to the Government of Ireland and IOM for putting together this high-level event that, dem that demonstrates quite clearly the strong support for the initiative to strengthen diaspora engagement. I want to seize the of opportunity to express the commitment of my government to fully implement the GCM in respect to all of its 23 goals, including, of course, Goal 19. Diaspora organizations are a pillar of sustainability. Their goals for sustainable development, social inclusion, political participation, as well as transnational dialogue. The consequences of the unprovoked attack on Ukraine by the Russian government highlight the importance of Ukrainian diaspora in Europe for our efforts to host and support 
Today, I would like to highlight diaspora engagement in the context of integration and social inclusion. In particular, the potential in the context of pre-departure integration measures. Germany aims to facilitate regular migration as much as possible and assist those who have decided to come in meeting the requirements and prepare a arrival appropriately. Diaspora organizations hold a significant yet mostly untapped potential in this context. As, a bridge, as bridge builders, they offer both know-how and the relevant network for such a system. That is why I am making such an orientation a cornerstone of my term as Commissioner for Migration, Refugees and Integration at the Federal Chancellery of Germany. Pre-departure orientation is not just about language. It's about information on local institutions. It's about managing expectations. It's about social and political participation and so much more. Our first impression and studies underline this. We have already launched a pilot in Turkey in close cooperation with the Turkish and Syrian diaspora to get started in this field, in this field and we will soon expand our cooperation with IUM as well. That is why I am excited to exchange views with you all on this and other fields here today and gain insights into your experiences and goals. I look forward to a successful conference and remain at your disposal. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Well, next to Montenegro and to His Excellency, George Radulovic, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Over to you, Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much. Distinguished Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's my profound honor to be in a position to present the Montenegrin perspective on this high-level event that comes in times of great uncertainties and challenges for Europe and global community as a whole. In such context, and having in mind that the diaspora, in certain sense, eradicates border between countries, I'm convinced that ever closer cooperation of our communities represents a beacon of hope in these dire circumstances that will lead us to the future of unity, equality, and justice for all. Since regaining independence in 2006, Montenegro has been firmly committed to establish and strengthen bonds with our diaspora, with a systemic and forward-looking approach aiming to include members of our community in all parts of the world in overall economic and social development of our country. To that aim, our institutions developed a normative framework in order to put forward more opportunities for cooperation and project development in both economic and cultural affairs. Thus, we have adopted the law on cooperation of Montenegro with diaspora immigrants, which resonates our steadfast commitment to include the Montenegrin diaspora in the process of overarching and sustainable development of our society. One of successful models has been tracing and putting into practice the comparative advantage of our economy has with members of our diaspora that have tremendous and distinctive potential to substantially contribute to overall development of our country. Let's not forget even for the moment COVID-19. Montenegrin Montenegro diaspora was of the tremendous help to, in the fight against this modern pestilence. The years-long perspective of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, because it's our remit, has been that establishing bridges of cooperation with our diaspora presents one of the most important segments of foreign policy. In that way, we have crafted policies to bolster the economic, educational, scientific, cultural, and other forms of cooperation with members of our community abroad. Such a broad such, such approach led to the Council of Cooperation with Diaspora Immigrants, established as a permanent advisory body of the government of Montenegro, tasked to take part in development and implementation of policies of cooperation with diaspora, whose members are also diaspora representatives. The government of Montenegro and our diaspora act as close partners on the same mission towards achieving the long-term and sustainable development of our country. Along those lines, we are continuously encouraging businesses in Montenegro to, to, to determine areas of closer cooperation with individuals of Montenegrin heritage and entities gathering our diaspora. 
Thus, we have organized business conferences, roundtables, and other types of business gatherings. Further on, we are committed to continue to systematically engage with our diaspora in economic sense that will generate a long-term force that will have a positive effect across a sustainable development pillars, social, human, economic, and environmental. Finally, as is stated in the summit outcome document, we firmly believe that the future agenda of global action could emerge as a common denominator across economies, politics, and societies, pinpointing the role of the diaspora in diplomacy and sustainable development. I can assure you that Montenegro, as a responsible and reliable subject of the international community, will contribute to achieving this common objective and continue the work of sustainable and responsible economic growth. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Minister. To Jamaica next, and to Senator the Honourable Leslie Campbell, Minister of State in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. Honourable Combe Brophy, Minister of State for Overseas Development, Aid and Diaspora of Ireland. Senor Antonio Vitorino, Director General, International Organization for Migration. Distinguished Ministers, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I'm truly delighted to be here in this beautiful city of Dublin for this historic Global Diaspora Summit. Let me first of all convey my deep appreciation for the support provided by the International Organization for Migration and the Government of Ireland, which has enabled the participation of Jamaica in this inaugural meeting. I also thank you for the kind hospitality which has been extended to my delegation since our arrival here yesterday. It is most fitting that this summit is being held in Ireland, given its record of empowering, engaging, and mobilizing its citizens abroad and their descendants through various initiatives. Ireland's model is one which many countries, including Jamaica, have admired and have sought to emulate. The convening of this summit is both timely and relevant, and is a clear demonstration of the interest and efforts made towards the development of multilateral migration governance since the first International Diaspora Ministerial Conference, which was held in Geneva in 2013. The endorsement of the United Nations General Assembly in 2018 of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration was a positive step, and Jamaica was pleased to have been among the majority of member states to have adopted the GCM. The decision to focus on Objective 19 of the GCM at the summit is important, given the nexus between migration and development and the need to give visibility to the important role and potential of migrants and diasporas in the sustainable development of their countries of origin and destination beyond remittances. These include human, social, and cultural capital, including knowledge and skills transfers. There's no doubt that the relationship between migration and development is a complex one. The diaspora is not a homogeneous group, and therefore governance approaches must be taken into account uh, <clears throat> to account diversity, background, status, needs, political and personal interest, and perspectives. The GCM has noted the multidimensional nature of migration and the need to apply an integrated approach to migration governance including through the establishment of mechanisms and enabling frameworks to build capacity and networks and to develop and strengthen cooperation programs. For this reason, Jamaica continues to make efforts to mainstream migration into its national development strategies and plans. A 2018 migration country profile was completed with the kind assistance of IOM and has been, a great, been of great use in guiding the efforts to develop a, a migration database that would allow for the collection and utilization of key data sets that may assist with national development. Jamaica's national policy on international migration and development and Jamaica's draft national diaspora policy present overarching frameworks for integrating international migration into development planning and outline strategies and actions for achieving policy objectives within legislative and institutional modalities. Ongoing partnerships with organizations such as IOM 
serve to strengthen institutional processes, procedures, and the adoption of best practices for effective migration management. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the importance of diaspora engagement and the need for mechanisms aimed at encouraging, supporting, and stimulating diaspora engagement in human humanitarian emergencies. To this end, the government of Jamaica will consider and examine new strategies and work programs going forward and will continue to work with its bilateral and international development partners to further integrate and strengthen its relations with its diaspora with a view to improving our ability to respond to such crises. The program for the summit provides an excellent opportunity for the sharing of information on a range of cross-cutting thematic issues of interest to our respective countries. Jamaica looks forward to the vibrant and robust discussions and to the positive outcomes which will provide useful direction for the International Migration Review Forum to be held later this year. I extend best wishes for a productive meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Campbell. We'll next to Somalia and to His Excellency Mohammed Abdi Hassan, Deputy Minister at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Global Diaspora uh, Summit 2022, dear Excellency Delegates and Honorable Guests and Hosting Country Ireland, I'm grateful and to present the Federal Republic of Somalia at this profound, crucial, and pivotal Global Diaspora Summit in Dublin, Ireland. Directly quoting from the remarks made by High Excellency, former President of Ireland, uh, Mary McLee at Liverpool, England on June 4, 2008, quote, the migrants heard march to the beat of two quite different drums, one from the old homeland and the other from the new country. The migrants has to bridge these two worlds, living comfortably in the new, bringing the best of his or her ancient identity and heritage to bear on life in an adapted homeland. End quote. That rich, profound, and successful history of Irish diaspora is what Somalia aspirants to emanate as they have succeeded some of the powerful countries in the world. I say this because the movement of the Irish uh, diaspora migrants and Somali diaspora migrants are significantly, significantly uh, similar. As emphasizes in the Global Compact of Migration Objective 19, we must empower migrants and diasporas to catalyze their development contributions and to harness the benefits of migration as a source of sustainable development. We live in an increasingly globalizing world, allowing citizens to act as transitional actors for whom, for whom hope and abroad are no longer fixed. Immutable location and many development countries recognize diaspora communities as underutilized offshore assets based on their financial and human capital. This particularly the case concerning the global Somali diaspora, the Somali diaspora uh, remits more resource than all uh, main development aid combined, according to data from the World Bank in 2020. Financial remittance is stipulated 24.9% of the country's GDP, placing Somalia as one of Africa's highest value of personal remittances as a share of GDP. This exceeds the globalist remittance average by far. We therefore view our diaspora communities as a critical development constituencies in development of Somalia and are seeking to establish effective mechanism to strategically mobilize their capital knowledge and networks. Somalia strongly supports the notion of government passing to maximize diaspora development contributions. We could reach scientifically significantly astonishing development potentials if implemented successfully. Reflective on this matter, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Somalia is developing its first national diaspora policy to foster sustainable partnership with its diaspora communities. Henceforth, we are grateful 
for the assistance and the facilitation of IOM in, in, in this policy development and has to find a meaningful aspect of diaspora and migrants. We are looking forward to learning and collaborating with the international diaspora network experts and delegates present in this conference. To conclude, I'm confident that the Global Diaspora Summit will successfully and strongly believe that our joint efforts will be fruitful and beneficial of all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Minister Hassan. Well, next to the Philippines, and joining us virtually is His Excellency Teodoro Loxon, Jr., Secretary of Foreign Affairs of the Philippines. Excellencies, the Philippines, as a lead participating state, is proud to join this event to highlight the impact of migrants and diasporas on sustainable development throughout the world. What earned us the distinction of GCM champion country was our commitment to raising awareness of a commonplace in many places, especially in advanced and developing countries. The UN Secretary General said it simply and best. The face of the woman who takes care of his mother like the faces of those who care for the sick and old of rich countries or just better off people in poor countries are those of migrants. It is very hard, if not impossible, to achieve sustainable development in the life and country of beings whose human quality is definingly to care in turn for those who loved and cared for them. Sustainable development is near inconceivable without migrants to be their surrogates in fulfilling that most basic duty of humanity to care for one's own. Not to mention getting done the work that must be done to keep countries and companies working and profiting at bargain basement investments and wages without migrants who have the added quality of being easily disposable by deportation so convenient. With over 10 million Filipinos abroad, we have translated this concern, this situation and their fate into strong government policies that address, to an extent we know still falls far short, their predicament. On the calculating side, the remittances of overseas Filipinos account for 10% of total Philippine GDP, injecting purchasing power to significant economic sectors, not to mention the plain sustenance of millions upon millions of family members that migrants leave behind. That the Philippines is reeling from the pandemic of the past almost three years shows the exact economic loss sustained in foregone remittances. As my department repatriated two million Filipinos, we took them home to safety, sure, and unemployment more surely. In the same vein, overseas Filipinos have been integral to the development of countries of destination. Their repatriation inflicted a similar loss in productivity and quality of life, not least in keeping going with incomparable skill and dedication, courage and compassion especially in the healthcare sector and at the fatal front lines of pandemic care. Cognizant of their immense contributions and in the name of basic decency, we strongly encourage all states to exercise their responsibility to uphold human rights, not only of the widespread Filipino diaspora, but of all migrants, regardless of status and origin. With GCM as platform, we pushed initiatives for Filipino overseas communities, preeminently with the Middle East for labor reform. Our model and world example remains the labor reforms we forged with mighty Germany decades ago. That's for sure. This is how we took leadership 
in the GCM debates. We did not propose untried improvements that were wishful thinking. Rather, we pushed for rights and reforms already long agreed by Germany and the Philippines. We led in the debates with a German-Filipino example. In response to the problems spawned by the pandemic and the re-emergence of post-pandemic opportunities to recover what was lost in the viral fire, we have embarked on five R's, repatriation, recovery, return, relief, and reintegration for a faster, finally streamlined, and finally again more honest and fair approach to deployment to overseas jobs. The Philippines joins all states in supporting the recommendations of the 2013 Ministerial Conference. A decade later, they stand as true today. Diasporas can connect states and societies and close information gaps that are key to right action on migration. An enabling environment maximizes diaspora potential, empowers engagement between partners, especially in crisis situations. We thank most deeply and sincerely the International Organization for Migration and the Government of Ireland for mounting this global diaspora summit. The Irish and the Filipinos have had one and the same experience of migration. Together, we can point to the right way forward because we know we've both been there and suffered, and above all, because we care. Thank you, Secretary Loxon Jr. Well, next to Egypt, and joining us virtually is His Excellency Ambassador Sula Abdel Sadiq, Assistant Minister for Consular Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Arab Republic of Egypt. We're actually just experiencing a little bit of technical difficulty there, so if you bear with us, we are going hopefully next to India and to Dr. Ausaf Saeed, Secretary of Consular Passport Visa and Overseas Indian Affairs at the Ministry of External Affairs. Honourable Ministers from various participating countries, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, I would like to uh, congratulate the Government of Ireland uh, Honourable Minister uh, Brophy, uh, Irish Minister for Overseas Development Aid in Diaspora, IOM DG Antonio Vittorino for organizing uh, a very useful uh, summit. Uh, I'm deeply delighted uh, to participate in the Global Diaspora Summit uh, in 2022 Ireland. This summit is being organized in close proximity to the first International Migration Review Forum, which is scheduled to be held next month in New York. I am also very happy that this summit is being organized in Ireland, where we have a significant number of Indians present. This summit is a timely and pertinent opportunity to deliberate on the Objective 19, focusing on diaspora and sustainable development, as mentioned in the Global Compact on Migration. Adoption of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, GCM, in 2018 has provided a comprehensive framework enshrining our collective commitment towards cooperation on international migration. Its guiding principles and 23 objectives are serving as a roadmap for countries in addressing challenges associated with migration. India is a signatory to the GCM and has played a very constructive role in framing the Global Migration Governance Framework. At the outset, I would like to emphasize the importance that our government places on, on our diaspora. The Indian diaspora is the largest and the most dynamic in the world. Indian diaspora is 32 million strong global community as technocrats, academics, scientists, entrepreneurs, healthcare workers. The Indian diaspora has made remarkable achievements and contributed significantly to the development of their host country as well as making India the world's largest recipient of the foreign remittances. India's approach to our diaspora is guided by four C's, care, connect, celebrate, and contribute. This four C approach is manifested through policy initiatives and welfare programs. One part of the strategy is focused on holistically covering all aspects pertaining to the needs of the diaspora, by providing them with counselor services, 
protection and outreach activities for awareness dissemination. The other part is directed at measures that encourage the diaspora to contribute to India's growth through philanthropy, knowledge transfers, investments in innovation and assistance, and in other development projects. India offers to its diaspora a unique initiative to remain connected with its motherland with the overseas Citizen of India card, which offers a range of benefits on par with Indian nationals. Our endeavor has always been to deepen linkages with the diaspora through initiatives such as the International Diaspora Day, which is observed once in two years, then the um, Global Diaspora Portal, then the No India Program, and several other uh, events like this. Our missions and posts, along with Indian cultural centers, set up across various countries, are playing a vital role in promoting India's culture through various activities with the active involvement of the Indian diaspora and community organizations. We have also been focused on encouraging research and education among the diaspora by providing attractive venues to Indian origin researchers residing in foreign countries to work in Indian institutes and universities. A conducive environment has been built within the country for encouraging investment, knowledge and skill transfer present among diaspora abroad. Initiatives such as Startup India, Made in India and Self-Reliant India are efforts in this direction. We have also launched MyGov portal, which is a remarkable initiative, providing a platform to everyone worldwide for offering suggestions towards improvement in governance at all levels of decision making. We have also launched several various welfare initiative schemes, such as the pre-departure orientation program for migrants. We have evolved an uh, integrated e-migrant portal, which is also now being linked to such portals uh, of uh, um, major manpower importing countries. We have also launched a global help portal for uh, providing assistance to Indian diaspora. We have also launched a major global fund called the Indian Community Welfare Fund, which is geared up for safeguarding the interest of our people. Uh, as you know, India has always played a great importance to the welfare of our people, especially during uh, conflicts and natural disasters. The best example is during the, in the post-pandemic situation, we have launched the biggest evacuation exercise in human history by evacuating millions of Indian citizens by land, water and sea from almost every part of the world. Again, we have demonstrated our commitment towards our diaspora by swiftly evacuating 22,500 stranded Indians in and around Ukraine through Operation Ganga. And earlier during the evacuation in Yemen, we had evacuated, uh, besides Indian, 22 other nationalities from the war zone under extremely challenging circumstances. Ladies and gentlemen, engagement policies with diaspora is a two-way process that is to be achieved through symbiotic and mutually rewarding policy measures. We need to appreciate that the character, potential, and needs of the diaspora change with each generation, and that this process has accelerated with technological advancements. The interests of the youth are rapidly evolving, and our policy modifications must keep up catering to their aspirations. We must also find answers to questions such as how climate change would impact mobility and migration, how would the transition from conventional energy to renewable energy impact jobs and migrations abroad? How we can utilize technological tools to engage with the diaspora and to look after their welfare? While we have accomplished a lot in terms of engaging with our diaspora, a lot remains to be done. It is at forums like these that we have an opportunity to sit together and learn from each other's experiences as we endeavor to work towards the betterment of our people. India as a country is prepared to share our knowledge and experiences in effectively managing its diaspora. I hope that the two-day deliberations of this conference would provide useful insights and valuable recommendations and outcomes at the end of it. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Secretary Saeed. Well, next to Kenya and to Ambassador Machiria Kamau, CBS, Principal Secretary at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much, and a good morning to everybody. Um, uh, Mr. Komi uh, Brophy, Mr. Antonio Vitorino, Honorable Ministers, Ex Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, I am delighted to be here today on behalf of the Republic of Kenya, and I'd like to thank the hosts for having us. The issue of migration, whose consequences, of course, the great historical diasporas of the world, which emanated from Europe, Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and elsewhere, 
has always been a hugely important issue for global development and for political evolution of many countries. The very character of some of these states in the world, particularly the countries of the so-called New World, is defined by migration and by diasporas. So it is only appropriate that these issues be discussed and given the necessary attention at this summit. Kenya, on its behalf, has three million Kenyans abroad, and we have in Kenya a number of diaspora communities who are resident in Kenya, from the UK, from India, from Pakistan, and even from Somalia, South Sudan, and Zimbabwe, who after two generations in our country are pretty much uh, local citizens of the country now. Your Excellencies, when we all came together to agree on the Sustainable Development Goals, the issue of diasporas and the reality and the imperative of migration was seriously considered. Importantly, we all agreed on setting clear targets on urgent actions to help us to not only open up and manage migration in order to make it more effective and less onerous, punitive and dangerous, but also to agree to undertake new actions to enhance the contribution of diasporas to national development of our countries and the world at large. Sadly, however, what we have witnessed in the latter part of the 20th century and still continues to this day is a closing down of borders, a severe restriction and constriction of migration as we have historically come to know. Moreover, it has been done through punitive visa and inhumane border regimes that have now been put in place primarily as protectionist actions by wealthy countries who tragically choose to characterize migration to their countries as being antithetical to their societies and as being a threat to their economic development. Nothing could be further from the truth. I think it should be clear to all of us that, uh, that it will not be worth the paper of the declaration that comes out of this conference if we do not recognize the realities that face diasporas and migration in our world today. It is clear that we have some serious introspection that we need to do in order that we can answer some of the difficult questions that arise at this conference. This is because we are dealing with the lives of millions of people in the diaspora and tens of millions of people who are caught up as we speak here today in the chain of migration that continues spontaneously and naturally throughout the world. In this regard, if this conference is going to make any contribution to the stability and promotion of prosperity of our nations while elevating the suffering and the disruption of restrictive and unmanaged migration, we are going to have to intensify our coordinated work and effort in managing better migration practices and in better facilitation of diaspora populations throughout the world. We have to absolutely make migration less threatening and more humane. And we have to make the lives of those who live in the diasporas more welcoming. Strictly speaking, from an African perspective, the issue of migration is painful and confounding. You see, Your Excellencies, African migration is still characterized as unnatural, as desperate, and as a retrograde process that is out of sync with the natural migration of human beings. This is not only unfortunate, it is tragic. It is unfortunate because it denies the world the great benefit of natural movement of Africans into global societies throughout the world. Just as, for example, Europeans have, have migrated throughout the world. But it is also tragic because embedded in this reaction to African migration, we have witnessed great human rights abuses, great suffering, and horrific and unnecessary deaths of hundreds, if not thousands, of Africans. It, is, it might not be known to many here, but most of the migration of Africans takes place within Africa, estimated at 86%, with only 14% of the migration taking place outside, towards other countries outside of our continent. Indeed, it is worth noting 
that 94% of all African migrations takes place legally. Yet, the narrative in the international media will portray something quite different. Moreover, of the few Africans that do migrate, they bring with them, on average, education levels that are among the highest of any historical group of migrants globally. One would think, then, that these facts would bring the world to its senses around the issue of contribution of African migration to global diasporas. But sadly, the contrary is the case. We need to ask ourselves why this reality prevails. What is it about African migration that is so antithetical to many governments and non-African societies of the world? And because this conference is about diasporas, we also need to ask ourselves about the well-being of our diasporas abroad that still face difficulties of integration and support. Distinguished delegates, later this afternoon, I intend to outline in detail measures that Kenya has taken to ensure that migrants and diasporas are embraced, enabled, engaged, and empowered in order to maximize their human, economic, social, and cultural capital, both in Kenya and in countries abroad. I am confident that the next two days will provide us with a valuable platform to share knowledge, experiences, opportunities, and challenges as we endeavor to positively contribute to, forthcoming, to the forthcoming International Migration Review Forum on the progress of implementation of the GCM and in order to maximize the benefits of migration and diasporas around the world. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador. Well, we go to Mexico next and to Mr. Luis Gutierrez Reyes, Director General of the Institute of Mexicans Abroad at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Muy buenos días a todas y todos. Un gran honor para mí representar al Gobierno de México mediante el Instituto de los Mexicanos en el Exterior de la Secretaría de Relaciones Exteriores en la Segunda Cumbre Mundial de la Diáspora. Reciban un afectuoso saludo del Presidente Andrés Manuel López Obrador y de nuestro Canciller Marcelo Ebrard. Quiero extender mi agradecimiento y reconocimiento a la Organización Internacional para las Migraciones y al Gobierno de Irlanda por esta iniciativa que busca sumar al primer foro de examen de la migración en mayo y de esta manera poner en el centro de las políticas migratorias a la diáspora o como indica el Pacto Mundial para la Migración Segura, Ordenada y Regular, mediante sus principios rectores, centrarse en las personas. México, país con la segunda mayor diáspora mundial, 38 millones de personas, de las cuales 6 millones indocumentadas, está plenamente comprometido con la implementación del Pacto Mundial. Consideramos fundamental promover el diálogo y por ello participaremos constructivamente en los foros multilaterales y debates sobre migración internacional, promoviendo una visión más humana de la migración al tiempo que esté inmersa en el desarrollo sostenible. Nuestra nueva política migratoria contempla la atención de las causas estructurales de la migración a través de la cooperación internacional, el desarrollo y el diálogo bilateral, regional e internacional. La política migratoria de México se alinea con los contenidos del Pacto Mundial para una migración segura, ordenada y regular, priorizando en todo momento el respeto a los derechos humanos y a la dignidad de las personas migrantes, sin importar su condición migratoria. Hoy somos el tercer país de acogida de migrantes a nivel mundial y pasamos de ser un país de tránsito meramente a convertirnos en un país de destino. Si bien los principios rectores del pacto son transversales e interdependientes, me permito destacar los siguientes objetivos del pacto, además del número 19, mediante el cual se busca crear condiciones necesarias para que los migrantes y las diásporas puedan contribuir plenamente al desarrollo sostenible en todos los países, por la relevancia que implican en el trabajo cotidiano de nuestro Instituto. 
El 14, mejorar la protección, asistencia y cooperación consulares a lo largo de todo el ciclo migratorio. El, 5, el 15, proporcionar a los migrantes acceso a servicios básicos. El 16, empoderar a los migrantes y las sociedades para lograr la plena inclusión y la cohesión social. Y el 17, eliminar todas las formas de discriminación y promover un discurso público con base empírica para modificar las percepciones de la migración. Menciono estos objetivos para destacar los temas más relevantes del pacto y las demandas de las comunidades mexicanas en el exterior, por lo que el Instituto de los Mexicanos en el Exterior ha desarrollado proyectos para empoderar a las comunidades, incluyendo nuestras ventanillas de salud, las cuales acercan servicios de salud preventiva y detección temprana de padecimientos a los sectores más vulnerables de la diáspora, las cuales además fueron fundamentales para acercar vacunas contra el COVID a los sectores más desprotegidos, los indocumentados en los Estados Unidos. Nuestras ventanillas de orientación educativa que facilitan el acceso de la diáspora <coughs> perdón, a la educación superior a través de becas y alianzas con instituciones educativas. El programa consular de emprendimiento para mexicanas en el exterior que capacita y dota de herramientas a mujeres con el objetivo de que alcancen su independencia financiera mediante el emprendimiento y la creación de empleo y economía comunitaria y con el acompañamiento y mentoría de empresarios mexicanos migrantes. La estrategia de participación cívica que busca apoyar a las comunidades en el exterior en el ejercicio pleno de sus derechos políticos que les permita participar en la toma de decisiones en México y en los países de residencia. La Red Global MX, la cual busca aprovechar el talento, el conocimiento de las comunidades mexicanas en el exterior para contribuir al desarrollo de México mediante transferencias de conocimiento y de tecnología. La Ventanilla de Atención Integral a Pueblos Originarios e Indígenas de México, mediante la cual se, se brinda atención especializada y transversal en lenguas maternas a las comunidades indígenas y afromexicanas en el exterior. <coughs> Por último, la Mesa Interinstitucional de Atención para Familias Mexicanas en Retorno, mecanismo de coordinación transversal a través del cual las instancias del Gobierno de México identifican e implementan políticas para facilitar el retorno y la reintegración de los migrantes en México, y, cu y cuyos resultados también están beneficiando a los migrantes que pasan por México o que hacen de México su país de destino. Como pueden ver, día con día se trabaja para reconocer e impulsar las aportaciones que decenas de mexicanos y mexicanas migrantes contribuyen a sus comunidades de origen y destino. Al respecto, es fundamental abordar el tema de las diásporas más allá del ámbito económico, como bien decía la vicepresidenta de Colombia. Se deben visibilizar sus aportaciones binacionales y globales en el ámbito de la cultura, la academia, la gastronomía, la sociedad civil, la política, el emprendimiento, la ciencia y la tecnología, etc. Mismas que deben formar parte de cualquier política pública que busque empoderar a las comunidades en el exterior. No obstante lo anterior, los objetivos del Pacto Mundial no se podrán cumplir sin acciones y responsabilidad compartida. Por ello, invitamos a nuestras contrapartes en todo el mundo a impulsar mecanismos de colaboración a fin de fortalecer la cooperación institucional e intercambiar mejores prácticas para fortalecer los servicios y atención que se otorga a las diásporas. La atención tomando en cuenta que, en una gran mayoría de los casos, nuestras comunidades enfrentan los mismos retos y dificultades en los países de destino. La migración segura, ordenada y regular no se podrá lograr sin poner en el centro de las políticas públicas al migrante, no a la migración y sin invertir en las diásporas en los países de destino. Únicamente a través del empoderamiento de nuestras diásporas, de la mano con líderes migrantes y representantes de la sociedad civil, se podrá construir una base para implementar los objetivos del Pacto Mundial y de esta manera facilitar que las diásporas puedan contribuir plenamente al desarrollo sostenible en todos los países. Muchas gracias. Thank you, DG Ray, as well to the African Union and to His Excellency, Ambassador Fahi Mohamed al Yawaili, Special Advisor for Partnership and Stakeholders in the Office of the Deputy Chairperson. Over to you. 
Um, Excellency Minister um, Brophy, Honourable Director General of the International Organization of Migration, Excellencies, uh, Ministers, Distinguished Representatives, Ladies and Gentlemen. On behalf of the African Union Commission, I would like um, uh, to congratulate the government and people of um, Ireland, uh, our hosts, and um, the International Organization of Migration for the successful convening uh, of this uh, important uh, meeting. And allow me, of course, to uh, fully uh, support uh, the speeches by the high-level representatives of the African uh, member states who spoke before me, and I know that there are some that are upcoming as well. So, Mr. Chairman, Africa as a continent has been blessed uh, with the widest variety of diaspora, reflecting various eras of our history, ranging from over uh, the 200 million people of African descent. This rich identity, culture, and heritage uh, that the diaspora exude in their social, cultural, and economic contribution uh, depicts actually the richness uh, of the African um, diaspora, which must be harnessed in a proactive manner uh, towards the continent's overall development. So the trends and data uh, uh, highlight that the approximately 19.5 million African migrants living out of the African continent based on the um, IOM um, statistics for 2022 um, does reflect uh, the significant um, uh, place that the diaspora holds uh, in uh, our African Union um, agenda. And this importance of the diaspora uh, is reflected in the constitutive act of the African Union, which, and I quote, in, um, invites and encourages the full participation of African diaspora as an important part of our continent in the building of the African Union, unquote. In fact, we call the African Union diaspora our sixth region. And as you know, there are five regional groupings uh, within the African Union. The diaspora is the sixth. So the African Union's definition of its diaspora charts the path for the Union to engage um, its diaspora in a well-structured and systematic way. And in order to build and institutionalize this more effective collaboration uh, with the African um, diaspora, um, I'm sure we all know that the African Union held its first global African diaspora summit, GATS, in Johannesburg, South Africa in May 2012 where the heads of states and governments, among um, other diaspora-related uh, items, agreed on the implementation of five diaspora legacy projects in addition to the well-constructed Global Diaspora Summit Declaration. So 10 years from today, uh, the African Union took the initiative and took uh, maybe the precedence in organizing its first diaspora summit. Mr. Chair and Excellencies, the efforts of the African Union did not stop at convening that summit 10 years ago. On the 2nd and 3rd of February 2022, the 40th session of the African Union Executive Council adopted the strategic business and operational framework for an Africa Diaspora Finance Corporation, AFDC, as the framework for one of these African Union legacy projects on diaspora movement. Uh, that came at a, after a discussion by the Ministers um, of uh, Finance, and of course it's currently also for operationalization under uh, discussion by the relevant um, subcommittees of the EU uh, Permanent Representatives uh, Committee. So when established that AFDC is envisioned as an independent non-EU continental financial institution operating as a social um, enterprise and working together with other African and global finance development and diaspora um, institutions. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to uh, highlight the African Union Commission's uh, contribution uh, on diaspora engagement processes to share the good practices, to identify continent-specific practices, to discuss gaps, and also, of course, to develop collectively within this uh, framework um, recommendations uh, from now on their own. Allow me to highlight five priorities for the African Union Commission for this year. First capacity building initiatives for AU member states to continue to develop advanced policy and program frameworks. Why? Because while there is a continental, regional, and national momentum for diaspora engagement, there remains several structural challenges relating to the capacity to develop sound policy frameworks that can generate developing impact from diaspora engagement. Priority two, overcoming information gaps related to diaspora engagement initiatives in member states, what we call the regional economic um, commissions, and, and of course at the EU level. So we're talking about national, uh, regional, sub-regional, and continental. With the view to harmonization of national level diaspora engagement priorities with regional and continental 
frameworks. Priority three for the Commission is to undertake um, the further feasibility study of the African uh, Diaspora Finance Corporation, which covers the business operations, the investment planning and criteria, and the application of the funds, um, and the application of the funds. Priority four, supporting the LOMI initiative uh, on the decade for people of African roots and diaspora, which started 2021 to 2031. And last but not least, celebrating by action, by action, uh, the 10th year anniversary of the Global Africa Diaspora Summit. Uh, so Mr. Chair, Mr. Director General, Excellencies, uh, forums such as the ones which we are right now at the Global Diaspora Summit are levers to establish, strengthen, and engage the African diaspora networks uh, to enhance the AU's diaspora and development agenda through fostering stronger bonds with uh, the diaspora towards the continent's um, economic and development agenda. And we do that in partnership, and that is why the such global forums uh, are most important, um, most important um, uh, platforms for us to engage on these issues. We are, as African Union Commission, committed to contributing to the summit um, um, and subsequently to the International Migration Review Forum um, of the Global Compact on Migration, uh, which we understand will be scheduled uh, for May 22. So um, we are here to partner and we are here to further outreach to our diaspora. We thank you again, Mr. Chair and the IOM for convening this important meeting. Thank you so much and how wonderful to hear you speak of your diaspora as your sixth um, region. That's wonderful to hear. Well, I think we can now go to Egypt next to join us virtually. His Excellency Ambassador Sula Abdul Sadiq, Assistant Minister for Consular Affairs, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Arab Republic of Egypt. Thank you so much, Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor and a privilege for me to participate today in the Global Diaspora Summit 2022, of which I would like to take the advantage to thank the Republic of Ireland for hosting such an important event and the IOM for organizing, participating in organizing, which is very timely as preparations is being made for the first International Migration Review Forum that will take place next month. Since Egypt is a country of origin, transit and destination for migration is already adopting the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, GCM. We have been working adamantly to implement the objectives of the GCM, including Objective 19, aiming at the creation of reliable mechanisms to enable migrants and diasporas to contribute to the sustainable development of their homeland. As a matter of fact, Egypt is a country of origin of about 10 million expatriates, which actually makes it one of the largest recipients of foreign remittance in the entire world. As for instance, it received last year, in that regard, an amount of 30 billion US dollars. The role of the diasporas play in the development efforts of Egypt is not just limited to sending remittances, but is even extended to the achievement of sustainable development goals. That said, I wish particularly to mention today two initiatives that are being implemented in that direction. The first one is called Aslak Tayyip Initiative, as also known as your Kind Origin Initiative which was launched last year to enable Egyptians abroad to support development efforts in Egyptian rural areas within the framework of the national project Haya Karima, also known as Decent Life, which is a national initiative endorsed by His Excellency Abdel Fattah Sisi, President of the Arab Republic of Egypt. Uh, the initiative aims to improve the demographic, social and health indicators by supporting economic empowerment in villages in a way that contributes to achieving integrated and sustainable development through the contributions of Egyptian li li Egyptians living abroad. It is perhaps, perhaps worth mentioning that this initiative is being implemented, especially in the regions in Egypt, which are 
a source of high rates of illegal immigration. The second initiative is called Masr Tastatiya, also known as Egypt Can. Through this initiative, regular conferences, each addressing a different industry, are held in the presence of Egyptian experts living abroad, behind which the purpose is to encourage Egyptian expatriates to share their, these expertise to contribute to the development of the Egyptian industry and support innovations. These are just two examples of the initiatives, uh, but there is so many others, but time does not allow to mention them all. On a separate note, Egyptian efforts to ev evacuate subjects from any place in the world during time of crisis are highly commendable. As for example, we just evacuated more than 3,000 Egyptians from Ukraine through the neighboring countries. And when COVID-19 struck and spread in, two, in 2020, we were able to repatriate more than 77,000 Egyptians to return back home. This is just an example of what the Egyptian government is uh, uh, prepared to do or, or doing at the time being, and uh, will keep continuing to uh, in this support of uh, article uh, of uh, uh, objective 19 with all the initiatives and all the efforts exerted by the government uh, towards the Egyptians in the diaspora and the Egyptian support. Thank you for your listening. Thank you so much. And to Bangladesh, to His Excellency Imran Ahmad, Minister of Expatriates, Welfare and Overseas Employment at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. His Excellency, Mr. Brophy, Mr. Antonio Vittorino, Director General IOM, Heads of Delegations, It is a great pleasure to be here in Ireland, a nation of saints, scholars, and 70 million diaspora, which is probably 10 times the population of Ireland itself, and the country which supported us during our War of Independence in 1971. That gives us additional sort of, uh, what would you call it? intertwining of thoughts as we sit here and talk today. As we celebrate 50 years of our relationship, of our diplomatic relationship, and when we talk about uh, the 71 War of Liberation, I, on behalf of Bangladesh, my Prime Minister, and as we are talking about the diaspora issues, 10 million Bangladeshi diaspora and migrants, including some here in Ireland itself, <clears throat> for hosting this Global Diaspora Summit in Dublin dedicated to the objectives of, to objective 19 of the Global Compact. Bangladesh has been or is a GCM champion country whose Prime Minister, while hosting 1.1 million Rohingya migrants from Bangladesh and championing over 10 million Bangladeshi migrants in diaspora globally, spearheaded in New York the Global Compact of Migration and Refugees. Bangladesh also hosted the ninth GFMD hosted in Dhaka in 2016 and pioneered the concept of the Global Compact on Migration. Bangladesh is possibly one of the very few countries that has a separate ministry dedicated to migrant and diaspora issues. As we go on talking about different uh, matters on these two issues, today's meeting or summit is basically for diaspora. But I would put it this way, that migrants and diaspora issues are so interlinked that I don't think we should even think about 
separating the two issues. We should think about keeping both the issues together. And this is where a lot of challenges is going to come in. Discussions will go on, but Bangladesh remains politically fully committed to prioritizing the whole government and the whole society approach in implementing Objective 19 of GCM. As a GCM champion country, we have already drafted our national action plan for implementation of all 23 GCM objectives, including Objective 19. Ranking eighth globally with more than 10 million migrant and diaspora and sixth in receiving remittance from them, Bangladesh attaches the highest priority in recognizing and mainstreaming the sustained contribution of its diaspora resources in our national growth and development. It may be noted that in the past few years, we have been constantly, our GDP growth has been 7% plus. And a lot of this impetus has come in from what we call the remittance. Last year, 2021, it was 24.77 billion US dollars that came in as remittance. Of course, not all is from the diaspora. A lot of it is from the migrant workers who are working abroad. And that is where I say that we should try to keep both the issues together and we could come up with maybe a better program. Excellencies, Bangladesh is currently one of Asia's fastest growing economies, as I've already mentioned. And even post-COVID, we are still not doing too bad. A lot of the migrant workers had come back. We have taken matters of reintegration, helping them out so that they can go back again. Now, in the last one year, most of them have already gone back to their work workplace where they were before. But there has been a dip in the remittance. This is also facts of life. But I can tell you this much, the number of migrant workers that have gone in the recent past, they will be starting to send money back. You will notice that I'm talking mainly about the migrant workers, because in my mind, any Bangladeshi staying abroad, whether it is as a migrant or as a diaspora, has to be treated together. When we think about the issues or how to get them involved, we have worked out a system, what they call the PIE, and that is basically, stands for philanthropy, investment, and expertise. The Bangladeshi diaspora has been fully active and interactive as far as these points are concerned. We have the Bangladeshi uh, expertise, they are now coming back. We must remember one thing that when, dias when we talk about the diaspora, the first generation diaspora generally has gone to set up shop in a different country. It is the second generation and third generation that we have to consider of getting their roots, make them what? Kunta Kinte. Come back to their roots. And that is where we are working on at the moment. The government has taken very many act uh, uh, actions for pulling back the diaspora to come to their motherland. So far, we have been very successful. And this success has been seen from the result that we've been getting from the, or response that we are getting from the uh, diaspora that we have. My ministry is dedicated to be in the forefront of handling all issues related to the diaspora. And I'm sure many other governments would think about something in that line, where if you have a large diaspora, then you should consider having a separate ministry, because that will make things easier for everybody else. Mr. Minister, <clears throat> Incentive to bring back in investment 
incentive to pull back to the roots has to be there. And the government has taken very many incentive proposals, particularly for safe investment, safe investment, because this is what happens to a lot of the diaspora when they invest back and their investment goes part. They lose their investment. We have to ensure that. So while we talk over this, when we come up to the, uh, the forum that we are going to have in May in New York, we will put up a specific proposal or uh, our uh, thoughts on these lines. And meantime, I would think that a lot of it should be going on so that the welfare of the diaspora, welfare of the migrant workers is all coming on, on stream as they say. We also pledge to create a global peer to peer diaspora networking hub and a new partnership that would include the voice of the diaspora. That is very important. And towards that end, we look forward to working closely with the DGIOM, the Irish government, and all our fellow GCM champion countries. I must make a point over here. The initiative taken by Ireland and the IOM just before the forum is, I think, a very right or timely decision or uh, interaction because next step is the forum and where certain hard decisions or strong decisions will be taken. And I hope that we will come up with good ideas so that we can bring everybody under one umbrella and the objectives of GCM, we will be able to reach, reach the objectives as put down in the GCM 23 objectives. I thank you all and thank you all again. And thank you again, Minister, for the excellent hospitality that we are receiving so far. Thank you, Minister Ahmad, and we in Ireland are indeed, of course, very, very uh, glad that the size of our diaspora dwarfs uh, the actual population by many, many multiples. We're hugely grateful uh, for that. And that concludes the um, opening introductions from the lead participating states. We will conclude this session with statements by the co-chairs of the Global Forum on Migration and Development. We go first to Senegal, to His Excellency, Mr Moshe Sarr, State Minister in Charge of Senegalese Abroad. Monsieur le ministre en charge du développement international et de la migration de la République d'Irlande, Monsieur le directeur général de l'Organisation internationale des migrations, Mesdames, Messieurs les ministres des Affaires étrangères et chers de délégation, Mesdames, Messieurs les organisations les représentants des organisations de diaspora, Mesdames, Messieurs, à vos rangs, titres, grades et qualité, tout protocole observé, chers participants. La gouvernance multilatérale des migrations et du développement, un des enjeux essentiels auxquels nos sociétés contemporaines sont confrontées, relève de nos jours de notre responsabilité collective. Gouvernement, Organisation interétatique, organisation non gouvernementale, société civile, médias, secteur privé, chacun jouant le rôle qui lui revient. C'est là tout le sens de l'objectif 19 du Pacte mondial pour l'immigration sûre, ordonnée et régulière, qui vise à créer les conditions permettant aux migrants et aux diasporas de contribuer pleinement au développement durable dans tous les pays. C'est dire que ce sommet, qui nous permet de réfléchir sur l'engagement et la prise en charge de nos diasporas, constitue une belle plateforme à pérenniser. C'est pourquoi je voudrais, au-delà de l'accueil chaleureux qui nous a été réservé et de toutes les facilités offertes, remercier et vivement, au nom de son Excellence, M. le Président Macky Sall, président en exercice de l'Union africaine, la République d'Irlande et l'Organisation internationale des migrations, d'avoir bien voulu associer 
notre pays a cette importante rencontre. Il me plaît de rappeler que notre pays, qui assure actuellement la présidence du Forum panafricain sur la migration, en tant que futur co-président du Forum mondial migration et développement avec la République française, a souhaité que la problématique de la migration soit inscrite autour des six axes, de six priorités que le Forum aura à traiter au cours de 18 mois consacrés à cette honorable charge. Mieux, nous voudrions que le FMD soit au moyen de renforcer le dialogue sur la migration entre le Nord et le Sud. Le Sénégal, pays de départ, de transit et de destination, dispose d'une diaspora très diffuse à travers le monde. Celle-ci passe pleinement à son développement socio-économique via d'importants transferts de ponts. Et rien que pour l'année 2021, et malgré la COVID-19, environ 2,3 milliards de dollars ont été reçus, soit 12,6 de notre PIB, une somme qui dépasse largement l'aide publique au développement. Cette réalité nous pousse à porter haut le plaidoyer sur la réduction des coûts de transfert de migrants vers les pays d'origine, notamment ceux du Sud, pour le plus d'impact dans les secteurs créateurs de richesses, de valeurs et d'emplois. Mesdames, Messieurs, permettez-moi de partager avec vous quelques actions qui permettent au Sénégal de s'illustrer dans la mise en œuvre de l'objectif 19 du Pacte mondial sur les migrations. En effet, notre pays a fini de consacrer la diaspora comme sa 15e région, subdivisée en 8 départements, avec l'élection de 15 députés issus de la diaspora et par la diaspora, la nomination de Sénégal extérieur au gouvernement, au Conseil économique, social et environnemental, au Haut Conseil des collectivités territoriales et dans certaines ambassades et consulats généraux. Au-delà de ces fortes décisions, plusieurs initiatives impulsées par le président Macky Sall ont permis de mieux mobiliser les compétences hautement qualifiées de notre diaspora, notamment dans les secteurs stratégiques tels que les énergies, pétrole et gaz, les infrastructures ferroviaires et aéroportières, les sciences émergentes, pour ne citer que cela, pour soutenir et accompagner les mutations économiques en cours dans notre pays. Plusieurs dispositifs et mécanismes permettent également de soutenir les initiatives entrepreneuriales de nos compatriotes établis à l'étranger. Le Fonds d'appui à l'investissement des Sénégalais extérieurs, FES, avec ses deux lignes de financement que sont le FSE, Fonds des Sénégalais extérieurs et le FFD, Fonds Femmes Diaspora, a permis de financer 612 projets de création d'entreprises au Sénégal portés par des Sénégalais extérieurs et renforcer l'autonomisation de 5100 femmes entreprenantes dans les pays d'accueil pour un montant global de 18 millions. 513 000 dollars américains entre 2013 et 2021. En outre, au niveau de la délégation à l'entrepreneur rapide des jeunes et des femmes, un fonds diaspora de 5 millions de dollars a été mis en place pour accompagner le retour au pays par la création d'entreprises. Pareille occasion me permet de rappeler que dans un souci d'équité, une politique active de soutien au Sénégal extérieur a été mise dans le contexte, a été menée dans le contexte de la pandémie de la COVID-19 grâce à une enveloppe de 210 millions de dollars pour renforcer la résilience de 126 724 compatriotes résidents à l'étranger. Je voudrais enfin, Madame, Messieurs, rappeler que la présidence sénégalaise de l'Union africaine entend participer au renforcement d'une compréhension mutuelle des enjeux de mobilité internationale et créer les mécanismes et instruments assurant une migration régulière et ordonnée au bénéfice de toutes les parties prenantes. Et vous remercie de votre aimable attention. Merci à vous, Monsieur Sarr. Well, finally, to France, and a virtual welcome to Mr. Christophe Leonzi, Ambassador for Migration, Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs. Merci, Monsieur le Directeur Général, Mesdames et Messieurs les ministres, Excellences, chers collègues, chers amis, 
En introduction, je souhaite remercier l'OIM et le gouvernement d'Irlande pour l'organisation de ce sommet. Tout d'abord, la France souhaite rappeler la situation des plus de 4 millions de réfugiés d'Ukraine et rendre hommage à la contribution majeure qu'apportent les communautés ukrainiennes présentes en Europe. Cette diaspora assure pour une large part l'accueil et l'hébergement des personnes fuyant la guerre et aide ainsi l'Union européenne à faire face dans la solidarité à ce défi historique. Ces événements récents prouvent la capacité de mobilisation très précieuse des diasporas qu'elles ont déjà démontré activement lors de la lutte contre la pandémie de COVID-19. Elles jouent aussi un rôle fondamental et primordial en matière de développement et à ce titre doivent être une voix active et écoutée. Depuis longtemps, la France s'est engagée auprès de sa propre diaspora, mais soutient également celles nombreuses qui se trouvent sur son territoire. Elle participe activement à faire des diasporas un facteur de développement. Dès 2002, la France a participé à la création du Forum des organisations de solidarité internationale issues des migrations, le Forum qu'elle soutient activement depuis 20 ans. Cette plateforme nationale regroupe, accompagne, structure et renforce des réseaux, des fédérations et des collectifs d'organisations de solidarité internationale issues de l'immigration, engagées dans des actions d'intégration en France et de développement dans les pays d'origine. À travers son plan d'action Migration internationale et développement, la France soutient la structuration et le renforcement des capacités des organisations de diaspora. Elle œuvre à faciliter et valoriser les transferts de fonds des migrants, à soutenir l'investissement et l'entrepreneuriat des diasporas et à promouvoir leur capital humain. L'action de la France s'inscrit donc pleinement dans les objectifs du Pacte mondial pour des migrations sûres, ordonnées et régulières, adoptées à Marrakech en 2018 et en particulier de son objectif 19. Cet effort, cette action a notamment pour ambition de faire des diasporas des actrices majeures des politiques publiques en matière de migration et de développement afin de créer les conditions leur permettant de participer de façon active, efficace et utile au développement durable de leur pays d'origine et d'accueil. Les diasporas disposent de capacités financières précieuses qu'elles mettent au service du développement humain. D'après les estimations de la Banque mondiale, le montant total des transferts financiers issus des diasporas représente trois fois l'aide publique au développement international. L'expertise, la connaissance et l'expérience dont elles disposent constituent également un atout particulièrement important aussi bien pour les pays d'origine que pour les pays d'accueil. Par la création de liens économiques, culturels, sociaux et humains, les diasporas enrichissent les sociétés qui les accueillent, tissent des liens entre les territoires, contribuent au développement des relations interétatiques et jouent un rôle clé dans la promotion des voies de mobilité légale. Par le partage de leur expérience, elles peuvent aussi contribuer à construire un récit équilibré et rationnel sur la migration, mais aussi alerter les populations, notamment ses membres les plus vulnérables, sur les dangers qu'elles encourent en empruntant des voies de migration irrégulières, notamment l'exposition aux êtres des êtres humains, aux prestations sexuelles, travail forcé, esclavage, trafic d'organes ou criminalité, ainsi qu'au trafic de migrants. Afin d'en accroître la portée, les contributions des diasporas doivent être autant que possible accompagnées de politiques publiques efficaces. Il est donc essentiel qu'elles puissent bénéficier d'un appui technique juridique, logistique et financier de la part des États. Donc, ils multiniveaux, à la fois local, national, régional et international, et plus réacteurs du développement. Dans cette perspective, la synergie entre les différents acteurs, et en particulier entre les diasporas et les États, est fondamentale pour accroître les effets de leur action sur le développement. La France veille à créer un lien constant avec les diasporas présentes sur son territoire mais également en dehors de ses frontières. Le succès du projet Mid Africa, qui accompagne techniquement et financièrement 250 entrepreneurs issus des diasporas africaines, 
depuis 170 projets d'entreprise dans leur pays d'origine, on est une parfaite illustration. Il repose sur un hub digital d'appui aux initiatives de solidarité pour le développement. La France soutient aussi depuis 2009 un programme d'appui aux initiatives de solidarité qui est un dispositif sénégalais de mobilisation et de soutien aux actions de solidarité et économique de la diaspora au profit de son pays d'origine. Il a déjà permis de financer 180 de voitures et d'accompagner 560 initiatives économiques. Convaincu des apports, des apports positifs et du rôle important que peuvent jouer les diasporas dans le développement économique, social et culturel des pays d'origine et pays d'accueil, la France et nos amis légales ont décidé de placer cette thématique au cœur de leur coprésidence du Forum mondial sur la migration et le développement, le FMLP, qui se tiendra du 1er juillet 2022 au 31 décembre de l'année prochaine. Si la présence franco-sénégalaise a choisi pour thème principal l'impact du changement climatique et la humaine, elle fait aussi des diasporas l'une des six priorités thématiques qui seront abordées lors des prochains mois. Mon prédécesseur, M. Starr, a évoqué les priorités que nous souhaitons développé pour ce forum. Bien que le forum FMMP soit dirigé par les États, il est ouvert aux organisations de la société civile, au secteur privé, aux autorités locales ainsi qu'aux représentants de la jeunesse. Ce format permettra ainsi d'engager un dialogue constructif et informel entre tous les acteurs, en particulier sur les questions et les enjeux relatifs au monde et au diaspora. Soyez être assuré sera à la hauteur de ce rendez-vous. Je vous remercie. Thank you to our co-chairs, France and Senegal. And that concludes our opening ceremony. We are now turning our attention to connecting with diasporas and how they can contribute to sustainable development.